I'd like at this time to introduce the Apollo 13 crew, Captain James Lovell, Mr. John Swikett, Mr. Fred Hayes. Jim? Fine, thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, I'd like to start out the uh, briefing by saying that I'm not a superstitious person. And therefore, when we were assigned Apollo 13, I thought nothing of it. As a matter of fact, some of my friends of Italian descent had said that 13 was a very lucky number and they were happy that I got that number. Uh, it all sort of started uh, actually just before the flight, uh, as was well documented. Uh, as we are approaching the final phase of our training, the last couple days are usually ones of which are taken very leisurely. We try to keep a couple days free just to let ourselves unwind from the long training cycle, to get plenty of rest so that when we launch that we're in good shape and, and uh, we can go with a sort of an easy mind. As you well know, uh, a turn of events occurred, and Ken Mattingly, who was uh, our command module pilot, uh, was exposed to the measles. And at that time, we had to make a big decision uh, to bring Jack along or to delay the flight. It was one which was not easy for me to help decide and when they asked me what I wanted to do. Uh, because we had worked as a team for a long time. But I also realized that the, the space program had matured to that degree whereby uh, we had quite a few people who were well knowledgeable about the spacecraft and who were well qualified to fly. As a consequence, uh, on Friday, we, we decided to take Jack along. And I'd like to say right now that I've never regretted that, that decision. Uh, we as a team, I think, can Jack in particular helped us out during our ensuing uh, odyssey uh, tremendously. Uh, at this time, I think I would like to just break off just a second and introduce uh, a couple other people of our team that, uh, that also served, although we're not as in the same position we were. Marilyn, would you take the stand, please? This is my wife, Marilyn. And uh, right next is uh, my wife, uh, Mary. Now, I think the entire crew of the Continental Stewards are here tonight for Jack. <laughs> Jack had a lot of help on this flight. The launch Saturday morning was not unusual. It was a very nominal launch. The, the suit up, the ingress to the spacecraft was very smooth. We had practiced it before. It seemed even a lot easier than I had experienced on Apollo 8. Liftoff came just as I had known it before. Uh, communications were excellent. And the entire boost phase was, has compared, was compared very favorably with what I had experienced before, except during the S2 burn, uh, at which case uh, I noticed the inboard light come on, indicating a nest, uh, on the second stage, indicating that an engine had shut down. I would called inboard uh, as was the normal procedure and realized then that it had come about two minutes early. And the ground confirmed this. And as a consequence, we had an early engine out in the S2 stage and our total boost time was about a minute longer. This did not impair our, our flight, however. We had enough fuel to uh, relight the third stage and go on into a translunar injection and uh, a trajectory towards the moon. The flight up until about 56 hours was 
I guess what you'd call entirely nominal. We had followed the flight plan. Uh, we uh, were ahead of the game. It took us a little bit longer to get rid of our pressure suits than we thought. And we had asked the ground about 55 hours if we could indeed get into the lunar module about three hours early. The flight plan called to go into the uh, spacecraft at around 58 hours. Uh, the ground said, fine, why don't you uh, open up the limb and go on down and do your housekeeping chores. There was one other little engineering task which we had to perform. Uh, and also in, with that was a television program which we were supposed to put on. So we decided to open up the lunar module. Fred got into the spacecraft, went down, looked at the uh, superhelium, the critical pressure on the superhelium tank to make sure it was nominal. We were having some problems with that before the flight. It was. And then we put on the little TV show, which was called for in the flight plan. I guess the show lasted for about a half an hour. And just after we had turned off the camera, Fred was still in the lunar module. Jack was back in the command module in the left-hand seat. And I was halfway in between in the lower equipment bay wrestling with TV wires and a camera and watching Fred coming on down when all three of us heard a rather large bang, just, just one bang. Now before that, uh, Fred being in the lunar module had actuated a valve which normally gives us that same sound. And since he didn't tell us about it, we all rather jumped up and were sort of worried about it, but it was his joke and <clears throat> we all thought it was a lot of fun at the time since something happened. So when this bang came, we really didn't uh, get concerned right away. But then I looked up at Fred, and Fred had that expression like it wasn't his fault. <laughs> and uh, we suddenly realized that something else occurred, but exactly what we didn't know. I'd like to go on now and let Fred and Jack explain just what their impressions were at this very same instance that I heard the explosion in the lower equipment bay. Jack? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the sensation I had uh, that I had felt a vibration accompanying the bang, uh, not a large vibration or shudder. Uh, I proceeded uh, to uh, look at Jim and, and, uh, and about the same time, which had, uh, I guess about two seconds had elapsed when I had a master alarm and uh, a main bus B undervolt light. Uh, I transmitted to Houston that we had a problem and proceeded to over on the right-hand side of the spacecraft to look at the voltage. Uh, the voltage at that time was completely normal. The current was not high, and the fuel cell flows were normal, which indicated to me that whatever it was, it was some sort of a transient that, uh, that didn't exist at that time. Uh, it, uh, me being a command module pilot, uh, and the source of the, the, uh, uh, the bang not immediately determinable, I, it was my thought that, uh, of course, I have a little more confidence in the command module, so I thought it occurred in a limb, and I said, let's get the hatch in here and, uh, and uh, so we can sit back and think about it, because we had the tunnel open at this time, and I was afraid that we might be vulnerable to losing pressure. So I proceeded to get the hatch in. Uh, to begin installing the hatch, and at that time, uh, Fred went back over to the uh, uh, lunar module pilot's couch, and I'll let him tell what uh, his observations were uh, as far as the uh, instruments and the other caution warning alarms. Well, uh, first of all, uh, due to my position, being a, a lot more familiar with the uh, limb side of the house, uh, uh, my natural uh, first impulse on feeling this uh, shutter and uh, an explosion was to uh, make sure the limb hatch little birder that was on the other main bus. And uh, this uh, induced an undervoltage on the other main bus. And uh, that's when I uh, got a little smarter and uh, thought uh, maybe I'd look at the other fuel cells, which I hadn't even uh, considered as having had a problem. And I found uh, fuel cell one also uh, not outputting any amps. Uh, 
from this uh, from this point on, there, we were kind of under the uh, under the hands of uh, Houston and uh, the further troubleshooting and uh, uh, looking at a few more dials down on a, another meter and the LEB to look at the regulated pressures and uh, and eventually we got to the point where uh, Houston uh, called up and asked us to shut down uh, fuel cell three, or shut down. Uh, uh, the reactance valve, and I uh, asked for a reconfirmation since uh, when you do that, it's sort of irreversible. If you shut one of these things down, they uh, uh, only can be restarted from uh, ground support equipment. And uh, they uh, assured me they really meant it, so I went through with it, and uh, subsequently the uh, same command was given for fuel cell one. Uh, about this point in time, the uh, cryo pressure, the oxygen pressure had uh, gone in the uh, cryo tank two, and the pressure in tank number one was uh, rather steadily, slowly, but steadily decreasing. It was obvious it wasn't holding its own. And uh, right about then, it, uh, it was quite apparent to me that it was just a question of time that the command module was going to be dead, uh, that we were going to lose that fuel cell also. So I kind of lost interest in that position and headed for the limb. I, I think one other thing that's, uh, that we neglected to mention, that uh, I abandoned my efforts to put in the hatch when Jim noticed uh, we had considerable venting out the side uh, of the command module. So they indicated we were losing some sort of uh, uh, liquid or material from the area of the service module. So it indicated to us that we truly had a problem in the service module. I guess it's kind of interesting to, uh, to know what the feelings are on a crew when something like this happens. When you first hear this explosion or bang, you don't know what it is. And we've had similar sounds in the spacecraft before that were for nothing. And then, uh, to me, my impression was, as we came back, that, uh, that we had an electrical problem that caused this bang, because we, in previous testing, we had uh, some problems along these lines. Uh, that quickly went away, and I looked out the window and saw this venting, and my, my concern was increasing all the time. It went from, I wonder what this is going to do to the landing, to I wonder if we can get back home again. And it uh, sort of went into that type of seriousness. And when I looked up and saw both uh, oxygen pressures, one absolutely zero and the other one going down, uh, it. It dawned on me, and I'm sure Jack and Fred about the same time, that we were indeed in serious trouble. It was apparent, and the ground told us so, and they were right on the, on the ball all the time, that the only way to survive the situation was to transfer to the LEM. And so uh, at that time, Fred, first of all, went into the LEM, got out our activation checklist, a checklist which normally is not used until prior to powering up the LEM to detach from the command module and prepare to go down to the lunar surface. And we started going through procedures to get LEM power on and to align the platform. The first milestone, and I consider this after the accident, I guess, more or less the survival now, the first milestone was to get alignment on the LEM platform. Alignments are important, you know, because uh, without knowing exactly which way the attitude of a spacecraft is in space, there's no way to tell how to burn or how to m use the engines of that spacecraft to get the, pro the proper trajectory to come home. So we had to have an alignment on board the spacecraft. We knew that the command module was going to lose it pretty soon because we're going to lose power. So as we worked, Fred and I went into the lunar module. Fred got the power on. We started to align the platform. We used a procedure that was in the activation checklist. Jack gave us the angles. Uh, there was a little bit of arithmetic involved in all these uh, procedures. And, and I had an occasion during practice to fail my arithmetic test. And I was so concerned about being sure that this arithmetic was correct that I had actually called down to the ground and let them do the math, came back in and put it in. But we did get a platform alignment, and that was our first milestone. From then on, it was an entirely different situation. And this little model might tell you exactly how, how we were. Up until the incident, 
the normal command is in the command module. Uh, control is by the service module engines, as RCS engines, as far as attitude control goes. But we transferred our command to the lunar module, and we are using the lunar module engines for control. We had done some practice in this before, but uh, really had never thought that we'd ever have to use this particular control situation. And to get control of this vehicle, uh, in pitch, you have to use one translation controller uh, in, in one way and in roll another way. And in yaw, you can use the ACA. So what we did, uh, Fred would handle one part of the control and I would handle the other in controlling the maneuverability of the spacecraft. We also had back here a service module that was completely filled with uh, main engine fuel. We had used very little of it, just in one small mid-course burn. And also, we had RCS engines that were almost completely filled with fuel. An important point to remember at this time, too, is the fact that we had gotten off what we call the free return trajectory. We had done our mid-course maneuver some time before, and this meant that we were no longer on a path that would allow us to be swung around the moon and come back towards the landing spot on the Earth. We had gotten off this trajectory because we wanted to uh, go to our landing site. So the first thing the ground told us to do was to burn the dips engine, the descent propulsion engine, uh, to get us back on that free return trajectory, which, if I remember correctly, was going to get us into, what, the Indian Ocean, wasn't it? Yes. I think I lost track of oceans after <laughs> a while. Ago. Yes, it was an Indian Ocean mm -hmm. at about 155 hours. About 155 hours. The uh, controllability of the spacecraft uh, was okay as long as we had our, our indicators up because we had practiced that, as I had said. But suddenly, to save power, we shut that down for a while, and we had to control it by only looking at our computer display. And I had never tried that before. I really don't know who had, and it's a very difficult task. And we spent a lot of our first part of our emergency or survival time just learning how to control the spacecraft in this mode. Our second milestone was what was known as the Parasynthium plus two burn. Our first maneuver was to get us back on free return. The second one was to get us home early. The nominal flight time back home was 155 hours if we had done nothing else. But because consumables were critical and the ground was calculating consumables and Fred was also doing the back of envelope type calculation which he figured if we were lucky, we had about one hour spare uh, consumables left before we had landed. We had decided, uh, or the ground had decided to burn at, uh, at about two hours past the moon, at about 79 hours, a maneuver to shorten the time to get home again. This was also going to be an automatic burn using the descent propulsion engine. And uh, this burn was also very successful. After that, the ground was very much concerned with power, and we were too. And we decided to go into a power down mode. We, we turned off just about everything, and I'd like to have Jack and Fred tell about our power down situation and some of our survival and environmental problems. Fred, go ahead. With that. Well, on the limb side of the house, uh, we uh, actually had already canned a pretty good procedure in a book called the Contingency Checklist, which is, was pretty appropriate. And uh, I guess, uh, well, first of all, to back up to the consumable business, uh, the one hour reserve I computed was on uh, water, and that was for the longer return. Uh, so as soon as we got the second burn in, we, we had a little more pad even. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I guess everybody, uh, myself included, uh, got uh, a little bit fooled about how, uh, how low the limb actually uh, could uh, get down to, and uh, after completing this power down, it settled down on uh, consuming about 11 amps an hour. And uh, that combined with the command module being uh, completely inert uh, led us to another uh, environmental problem, which uh, Jim will discuss uh, again very shortly. Okay, on the command module side of the house, uh, as soon as I found uh, that uh, I had the batteries on the line also to help out fuel cell two. 
And as soon as I had ascertained that uh, Jim had, uh, and Fred had uh, powered up the LEM, uh, we shut down and fuel cell two uh, uh, gave out on us. Uh, we powered down the command module completely. Uh, just prior or subsequent to Paracynthian plus two, uh, we set all the switches in the command module in a basic switch configuration. Uh, this configuration so that the ground and us could work from a standard uh, switch configuration. And then we began a series of uh, uh, procedures. Uh, we were interested in, uh, did we indeed have a, a main bus B, or had we lost it? They'd go back into the command module, and it was quiet, uh, nice and comfortable, and they'd try to get some sleep. Of course, in the early periods of this uh, particular flight now, we didn't want to sleep too much. We were sort of worried of what was going to go on. I went in there one time to go to sleep, and Jack was on top of the couch and said, Jack, put up all the window shades. Uh, let's get the place nice and dark. We'll, we'll just relax and have it nice and dark in here. We can really get some sleep. And I woke up a couple hours later, and I was freezing. Uh, as normally happens, putting up window shades in, in space cuts out the sunlight and normally cools down the spacecraft. But in most flights, the heat from the systems will quickly rewarm it. And as soon as we get the window shades up, it'll be a normal position again, but we got the window shades off after that, and the spacecraft never did warm up again. Command module just slowly kept going down in temperature until I think uh, just prior to reentry, uh, it was down to about 38 degrees. And along with that, it was a, a sort of a chilling uh, coldness. The walls were perspiring, the windows were completely wet, and it, uh, it wasn't too healthy. I recall that we went in there to get some hot dogs one day, and it was like reaching into the freezer for the, for the food. Uh, Jack, why don't you tell them about some of the innovations that, that the ground gave us in, in uh, for instance, the lithium hydroxide canisters, which I thought was quite interesting. Well, we, we did have a, a shortage of lithium hydroxide, and the ground read us up a procedure in order to adapt some of the command module lithium hydroxide canisters uh, for use in the LEM. And uh, as they read this thing up, Jim and I constructed one of these things, at this point in time, I think the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide was uh, reading about 15 millimeters. And we constructed two of these things and put them online, and I think within an hour, the uh, partial pressure of CO2 was down to two tenths. So these were very effective devices, and uh, we used four of these, uh, of the command module canisters, and never did use the uh, uh, secondary, uh, the main canister that we had in reserve that was uh, for the lunar module. Of course, as the, uh, as the temperature went down, uh, we became concerned about keeping warm. And uh, Fred and I broke out our lunar boots, which we had uh, stowed away in the uh, lunar module. And Jack looked at his wet feet a couple of times. <laughs> but he had an extra set of underwear, so he put that on. We actually had a third little sleep restraint, which Fred uh, then put on and buttoned up and kept a little bit warm. One of the biggest problems we had <clears throat> was one which might have uh, hurt our trajectory, and that was that we didn't want to dump things overboard. As it turned out later on, it, it was more of an imaginary problem than, uh, than we thought at the time. However, uh, we, were, we thought we were told anyway that uh, don't put any wastewater dumps over the side because it might disturb the trajectory, and we're tracking you, and we want to make sure that you can come back and hit the uh, proper angle to re-enter. Fred, why don't you tell them what we did with all that stuff? <laughs> well, the, uh, the things we had on board that were built for that sort of purpose were uh, three bags on board the command module, oh, about, about that size square, that were really a, a backup, uh, uh, provided for a backup mode of operation uh, in case the normal uh, Myrtle system failed in the command module still for overboard dump, but they did have a reservoir. On board the limb for uh, draining out of the suit on the lunar surface, uh, we had uh, six well, bags about this size in the limb. Uh, beyond that, we had the, uh, the three UCDs, which are uh, bladder pieces of apparatus that we uh, each wear normally under the suit. 
and uh, that was about uh, only, the only uh, natural uh, sort of gear we had for this sort of stowage. So uh, we looked around, and uh, in the limb uh, we have a, a tank that's mounted uh, in back of where uh, the uh, flight data file is located on the uh, left side. It's called a Pliss condensate tank, and uh, it, its purpose is uh, when you're refilling the Plisses on a lunar surface, uh, some of the water that's outside the, uh, the water vessel is allowed, is allowed to uh, escape and uh, it's supposed to drain into this tank. So uh, we had enough, uh, fortunately, enough uh, combinations of hoses and uh, quick disconnects between the uh, two vehicles using both limb and uh, command module gear that we uh, found a combination that uh, we could uh, hook up our UCDs to uh, the fitting uh, that went to this tank. So that, uh, that saved us for a little while. Uh, then uh, after that one uh, got full, uh, we looked around some more and uh, we'd come across uh, two uh, bags, fairly large bags, they're about that long that were in the limb. And their purpose was uh, after the first DVA, uh, in fact, there was one of them I showed on the TV show, uh, we were to use these bags uh, to drain the remaining water out of the plisses and determine actually how much water we had left. So uh, again, this, this turned out to be a rather uh, weird uh, kludge to get to, to drain into that bag. I think uh, later on you may, may get to see that, uh, that piece of gear. But it involved the use of a six foot long hose with a T in the middle hooked up to this uh, bag. And uh, so uh, we uh, succeeded in uh, using both of those uh, large bags for uh, storage. I was going to show it at the end. So you see that uh, survival uh, uh, now became one of, uh, of initiative and ingenuity, and, and it was one which the ground continually helped us uh, along. We had all kinds of people on the ground trying to think of ways of, of extending our lifetime. Uh, we were also thinking of ways of using perhaps the PLIS system to use it for oxygen or, the, uh, or our emergency oxygen supply uh, in case we ran out. But as the flight progressed, the ground calculating our, our consumables saw that we were actually using less power, less water, less oxygen, and our lithium hydroxide canisters were holding up quite well. So it was, uh, it was getting better all the time, fortunately. We did power down everything, though. In about 105 hours, the ground, after some tracking, realized that we were not on a trajectory that would get us safely back home and that we'd have to uh, make another maneuver. By this time, the, uh, the crew stations became uh, a lot different. There are three people in the lunar module now, usually built for two, because the cold had driven Jack away from the command module. And Jack's normal position was on top of the ascent engine can, overseeing what Fred and I were doing. Uh, this last maneuver was going to be unique because we did not have the platform powered up. So we didn't have a normal method of determining the attitude of the spacecraft in order to perform the burn. On Apollo 8, uh, some time ago, we were concerned with perhaps losing a platform on the return voyage home. And since no one had ever made a lunar trip before, we were looking at sort of way out ways of determining how we could make these corrections home. And uh, some of our people here at MSC had come up with an idea about using the terminator of the Earth to orient the spacecraft and then the sun position to get orientation and pitch. And with that knowledge, we could then make uh, corrections to, to correct our angle of entry into the atmosphere. And as, as you know, I think that the, en the angle of entry into the atmosphere is a, is a very small angle, only about two degrees. And so it has to be controlled very closely, and that's what the main tracking is for. So at 105 hours, they gave us instructions to uh, relight the descent engine uh, to orient the spacecraft in this manner and uh, give this particular procedure a try. And when they read up the procedure to us, I just couldn't believe it because even on Apollo 8, I thought I'd never in all the world have to use something way out as this. And here I was on Apollo 13 using this very same procedure that was developed some time ago. Uh, <clears throat> this maneuver again was uh, completed on time. And because it was a manual burn, we had a three-man operation. Jack would uh, 
take care of the time. He'd tell us when to light off the engine, when to stop it. Fred handled the uh, pitch maneuver. I handled the roll, roll maneuver, and I pushed the buttons to start and stop the engine. So maybe we ought to recommend a three-man limb after this. I don't know. Again, uh, uh, after this maneuver, we were again powered down, and it became one of just merely hanging on our our maneuvers from then on were missed, merely drifting, and they were done to keep the, the thermal control in the spacecraft as even as possible so that one side wouldn't cool off too much or the other side wouldn't heat up. And uh, our flight uh, progressed that way down to about five hours prior to entry, whereby throughout the night and throughout, throughout the days just prior to this thing, the ground, of course, was working feverishly with crews in the simulators and uh, with the engineers looking at the systems to read up to us a set of procedures uh, which we would be able to follow to uh, make a successful entry. And I, I kind of think one of the most important points that can be made of this flight is the cooperation and the coordination and the, the initiative that people have when suddenly faced with an unusual situation that can respond uh, to come up with the answers. And they did. They read us up procedures. Fred and Jack and I practiced these procedures uh, by reading them and then completed them. I think it's, a, it's amazing the way that people can respond so fast to get this job done. We were in a different situation now because normally when you come home, you have only the command and service module. So the only thing we have to get rid of is this service module just prior to entry of the atmosphere. Coming home now, though, we had a dead service module. We had a command module that had no power to it. We had a lunar module that uh, was a wonderful vehicle to travel home with, but didn't have a heat shield, unfortunately. And, and uh, shortly, we'd have to abandon her. Joe so just going to ready, get ready to arm the pyros. And he said, I'll get a go from Misfin. I says, Fred, we don't have any telemetry with Misfin, so you're just going to have to put your fingers in your ears and stand by. So I armed the A system, and I could hear the relays, and uh, nothing happened. And I armed the B system, and nothing happened. So I kind of felt we were home free. Meanwhile, I'm back in the lab with an open tunnel, hoping that nothing happens. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and the procedure went well. We, we used a, a push-pull method. And uh, Jim and Fred were uh, in the LEM and uh, using the translation controller to give us some velocity. And when Jim yelled fire, I jettisoned the service module. And, uh, and it went off amidst a lot of debris, which is usual, and uh, Jim began to pitch around to try and photograph it. You might, uh, Fred, you might tell him about the yeah. pitch around. You got the first look, see, uh, and Well, uh, gr the ground had told us that the best view of the service module, as soon as we jettisoned it, was through the number five window. This was in the command module. It's one of these side windows. So as soon as uh, Jack had jettisoned the service module, uh, he went over to the number five window. Well, the force of the jettison had uh, pitched the rest, and you might see what we have now. We got rid of all this, and so now we have the command module and the lunar module together, which is an unusual combination. We've never flown this before. It forced the uh, lunar module to pitch down rather than to go straight, and instead of pitching up right away, I couldn't see it, so, and Jack couldn't see it. So then I finally started pitching up, and through this overhead window, this this docking window up here, I finally caught sight of the, of the, lunar mod of the service module as it uh, tumbled around in view. And uh, it was, uh, to me, sort of an amazing sight. I didn't realize uh, that this whole panel by the high-gain antenna was blown clean off uh, right along the area where the panel normally swings open. I could see uh, the interior, I couldn't see exactly what was damaged. I could see material hanging out from the interior. And uh, about that time, because uh, my description wouldn't be half as good as a good photograph, I reached for my camera. We had three cameras, and I started taking pictures through this little uh, docking window. Jack then, uh, knowing that he didn't see anything from his window, uh, started to come down through the tunnel to the LEM. And Fred, meanwhile, had got his cameras ready, and the spacecraft had been maneuvered to a point where the service module was then visible in the front window. And uh, Fred was taking pictures and Jack was taking pictures of the service module, trying to capture uh, some of the damage that, uh, that we could see.
The remainder of the flight went just as the ground had told us uh, to do it. We had kept in that position. I had gotten an alignment which, from the earth and the, uh, from the moon and the sun, which was good enough to transfer back to Jack an alignment, a rough alignment, so that he could get a very fine alignment in the, uh, in the command module. And at two and a half hours, he started powering up and getting this alignment. And uh, my only thought then was, as I was sitting by myself inside the lunar module, I could see the Earth because it was the nice big triangular window while Fred and Jack were powering up the command module. And, and even though it maybe wasn't noticeable to me, it looked like it was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I kept yelling back to Jack, how are you coming? Are you doing fine? Uh, uh, you know, when can I leave Aquarius? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> he was he was a little bit nervous he, when he say he was kept asking he kept saying Jack how you coming the earth is getting bigger <laughs> I think uh, he was trying to hurry me but I don't know but Jack did a fine job he got a very good alignment which was I think accountable for some of our good automatic guidance into a landing and uh, finally when he uh, got the alignment and all powered up I by that time, the, the lunar module looked like a, uh, just like a packed garbage can. We had the big drogue in, the probe, uh, big bags full of uh, debris that we had accumulated during the six days. And I then went from the lunar module, closed the hatch, came on down, and uh, we jettisoned the lunar module and uh, came on in with a recovery, which I think that you people have saw better on TV than we felt in the spacecraft. Slide. Oh, yes. Well, we have one picture which uh, we thought uh, Fred might explain a little bit about. Don, when you were coming down uh, that manual business of aligning the platform, and particularly again about when the, when the supercritical helium tank burst, I understand that when you did a non propulsive maneuver, you were suddenly rocking in the right way. Well, uh, we, there was a lot of, of fortunate incidents in 13 that uh, would make it a completely unlucky flight. We, at the time it happened, I thought it was the worst possible time. Obviously, it was not the worst possible time for this particular incident to happen. Uh, we were lucky in the fact that we, that we had a, a base support that was uh, well receptive to immediate uh, organization and uh, getting us uh, the, the problems and the procedures to continue. That we were extremely lucky in. Uh, we uh, found out that we could operate the spacecraft uh, and do procedures with a lot less systems than we anticipated. I was very reluctant to turn off the guidance system, the platform, because I knew that once I did that and we could not see stars outside the window, especially because of the debris that was lying out there and venting from the service module that uh, I would be very difficult to get alignment on my own. These are areas, I think, that, that we were lucky in. Uh, Captain Lovell, uh, what do, did you have in mind when you made the remark, uh, I think this is going to be the last moon flight for a long time? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we were, of course, uh, you must realize our position. We were going around the moon. We didn't know what happened. And uh, we looked at the moon. I had been there and, and Fred and Jack were taking pictures because regardless of anything, they were bound to take pictures. And I said, come on, we have a burn to go in two minutes uh, or two hours. Uh, at that time, not knowing what we were going to do, uh, and they were getting as many pictures as possible, I had perhaps thought that maybe this was going to be the last moon flight for a long time. But looking back on it now and looking back on the way that, that uh, NASA has responded in helping us get home and analyzing the thing, I don't believe that anymore. Uh, I think it's going to be one where we can analyze our problems, and uh, I foresee that uh, we can get this incident over with and uh, can charge ahead. I wouldn't be scared to fly with the fix. Jim, speaking of that subject, flying again, you told us this was going to be your last flight, but that you did want to walk on the moon before giving up flying. How do you feel now? Would you want to go back and take a crack at Apollo 14, 15, 16, or is Maryland... Uh... Well, I'm very much disappointed, just as uh, Fred is and, that, and that Jack, that we couldn't complete the mission. We, we certainly wanted to uh, 
to uh, uh, make a lunar landing. Frau Morrow has so much to offer, uh, we thought. We spent an awful lot of time on it. But uh, this was my fourth space flight, and there are many people in our organization who have not flown and uh, who deserve to fly and who are talented enough to fly. And uh, on my own, uh, they deserve the mission. If, uh, they, if, if they feel that, uh, that this team should go back there, I'm certainly uh, uh, willing to go back. But uh, uh, otherwise, that I think other people ought to do it. You are ready to go back. You don't feel cheated if you don't go back. No, I, of course, would like to have landed on the moon, uh, but I, I feel that perhaps what we got out of this flight was also well worth it. Captain Lovell, in that connection, we were told at all the briefings before this flight that Apollo 13's flight plan was a very important one, not only for the science you would get off the moon, but also because of the pathfinder photography that you would do subsequent to the landing. Now, I'm wondering if, in your mind, you think that it will be necessary to refly the Apollo 13 profile, and if so, what crew would be better qualified for it than the one which has trained for it for three years? Well, uh, let me answer that question sort of backwards. As I said in the beginning of the conference, that uh, on a two days notice that uh, Jack Swike had replaced Ken Manley. Ken, I think, was, is perhaps one of the most conscientious pilots that we have in our space program. He really knew that command module. He knew the flight plan of Apollo 13 better than anybody. Uh, yet, but Jack could replace him and could do a good job. I think that uh, it's not so much an individual crew anymore in, in, in NASA. I think any crew that was put together can do any job. And if the scientists feel that Frau Morrow is, is necessary to revisit, then I think that uh, any crew that happens to be assigned to that particular mission can take what we have already done and we have done a lot of groundwork on Frau Morrow, and improve upon it, perhaps, and do a good job. Uh, just to follow up, are you saying then that uh, young Mattingly and Duke would be a good crew to fly Apollo 13? And do you think Apollo 13 should be reflown, which was really my basic question? Well, uh, you're basically asking the wrong person. First of all, I'm not in the selection of people who fly spacecraft, and second of all, I'm not in the scientific uh, area to find out just what areas should be revisited. Uh, obviously, we have lost one lunar landing. We didn't make it. Uh, if Frau Morrow was worth it, uh, in, our, in our training, uh, Frau Morrow had a lot to offer. Then we should go back there. Bootstrap photography is very important. We should do that. Uh, but uh, this is up uh, for uh, larger decisions and uh, longer lead decisions. I wonder if the two uh, newcomers to the moon could just tell us whether they had any impressions of it as they went whizzing by. Well, we've, we've already been uh, told by Jim what color it is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I think uh, my impression uh, of it uh, as we passed, uh, the closest we got was 137 miles. And uh, I think I have about the same impressions of, as, as the men who have visited previously, that it's very stark, uh, it's desolate, uh, it's, it's almost awesome in its desolation. Uh, and uh, we didn't uh, get the chance, because we were going to be doing a burn, to, to really do any uh, uh, real detailed looking at it. But uh, I guess that would be my summation of my feelings, that it was almost awesome in its desolation. Yeah. What implications, if any, could this accident of Apollo 13 have on future Apollo missions and deep space missions, say to Mars or Venus? Fred? <laughs> well, I'm not sure there is uh, any sort of uh, direct uh, correlation that I can think of, uh, uh, with the exception of uh, uh, maybe bringing home uh, rather early some of the problems and uh, concerned with uh, power down modes of operation and uh, and uh, making sure an uh, environmental control system uh, can work uh, equally well to keep the occupants comfortable, uh, uh, both for uh, normal operating power levels as well as uh, 
uh, emergency sort of power down levels. Tim, you said um, you people on TV saw a better recovery than we felt in the spacecraft. Can each of the three of you comment on what your feelings were during your time of splice down? Well, of course, uh, when we hit the water, we were, we were very happy to be back home, and we commented on that fact. Uh, uh, the recovery uh, of 13 was almost uh, textbook recovery. It was a calm day. The, the actual splashdown itself was very mild, and uh, the Navy did a grand job. Uh, I'm not prejudiced, of course. But, uh, but we were, of course, disappointed that we did not complete the mission. Uh, how about uh, how about uh, the other two of you uh, telling us uh, how you feel about flying again, what this experience has meant in terms of your professional careers? I, I think that what this has done for me, uh, if anything, has increased my confidence in the ability uh, of this spa nation's space program to take an unusual situation and react to it and come out with a successful conclusion. I, I consider recovery of the crew a successful conclusion. Of the <laughs> but I have, I have nothing but the utmost admiration for the people on the ground who work tireless hours to get us back. And I guess I uh, might answer that by uh, saying uh, sometime this year I'll have had uh, 15 years with NASA and uh, I don't figure I'll retire for another 30 maybe. So uh, I'll just do whatever, uh, whatever job the agency uh, decides uh, is the best place I can be and to contribute the most. Captain Lovell, was there ever a moment when uh, you or any other member of your crew thought you did not have enough consumables to make it back in those first hours? And if so, what were your feelings? Well, uh, as I said, there, the, our feelings varied during, our, during the emergency. Uh, there were moments when I didn't know how much consumables we had, whether we could make it back or not. But uh, uh, in a situation like that, there's only one thing you can do. You just keep going. And uh, you just keep thinking up where you can get more consumables. And uh, so that's exactly what we did. You made any recommendations uh, thus far on changes in procedures or redesign of equipment based on your uh, experience? No, we haven't. Uh, I, all this will be taking place in the ensuing weeks. Uh, while looking at the uh, service module after you jettisoned it, um, one of you said, and I'll quote that, I think the explosion from what I could see, Joe, had stages. Uh, what made you think so, and do you still think so? Stages? The, the explosion had what, sir? Stages. stages. The explosion had stages. Oh. I don't recall that incident. I, I was the first one to see it, and I said it looked like a mess and uh, that I could see the panel missing. Uh, but I don't recall any of the comments that I made. Terry, you want to? Terry? Thank you. Gentlemen, all the time that you were in trouble coming back, you were obviously extremely grateful, and you've told it again and again, for the cooperation of the ground crew, and rightly so, naturally. Where, was there an awareness, or the same sort of an awareness, of the infinite power watching over you and caring for you to get down? Were you aware of that? Well, if, you're, if you're asking me whether I prayed, I certainly did. <laughs> and, and I have no doubt that, that perhaps my prayers and the prayers of the rest of the people did an awful lot, contributed an awful lot for us getting back. John Lennon. At one point, just prior to the to uh, jettisoning the LEM, it, there was a comment about the flight plan being read up to you, and it was akin to reading uh, War and Peace over the air. I'm wondering what it must have been like to take it down in a spacecraft where, at one point, someone also said they were running out of flight plan pads. 
this, this was the, I assume, the procedure in the command module, which was quite lengthy. Because one of the things I think that, that's evident from this thing is we really threw away the book. We had never powered down a command module in, in space, and we had never re reactivated one. And we wanted to get it right. And so I read back every switch and every circuit breaker. And uh, it was a lengthy procedure. It was one that was worked out and verified by the ground. And its success, I think, is well documented. Jim, did you notice any unusual vibration with the uh, S2 or the J2 shut down? And if so, could it have any effect at all on the uh, service module trouble? Well, we did notice an unusual vibration just prior to or just during uh, the number five engine on the S2 shutting down during the boost phase. Uh, I doubt seriously if it had any trouble with the, had, you know, gave any trouble with the service module, but I have no evidence to, uh, to say yes or no on that. A question for whoever wants to answer it. Would you tell us twice during the mission you made, you asked the ground if the uh, flowers were blooming in Houston yet. Apparently this was a code. Would uh, someone explain that? And then the second question is for Captain Lovell. There's a movement uh, in Wisconsin, apparently, uh, growing now to nominate you to run against Senator William Proxmire, and we're wondering if you would comment on that. Yeah, the, uh, uh, the first question, uh, it was a, uh, uh, again, a sort of a code, you're right, that we had worked out uh, with our Capcoms, uh, uh, really in, in ans asking a question about uh, Ken's condition uh, as to whether uh, he had uh, come down with the measles yet or not. And we're still waiting for Ken to come down with the music. Come on, Ryan. Jim, what about your political future? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> no, I don't have any political affiliations in the state of Wisconsin at this moment. Uh, when you saw the damage that was done to the service module, were there any fears that the heat shield might have been damaged by that? I had uh, no qualms about it at the time. Uh, I guess I really wasn't thinking along those lines because I knew that uh, we were re-entering very shortly and that regardless of the damage to the heat shield that you know, it was going to either have to take it or not take it. Did, did you all think I that? had no qualms at all. That heat shield is, is, I don't know whether you're aware of how thick it is, but it takes an awful lot to damage that and I, I had no qualms at all. Yeah. Jim, you had a, uh, were faced with a uh, a perhaps as precise flying job as you ever will face, yet you say you had to fly the limb a completely new method. Will you elaborate a little bit on how you and Fred worked this out? Well, the methods of flying the stack, as you see it here, have been worked out before by, by crews in a procedure which we normally practice for, and that is uh, in lunar orbit, as we're slowing down to go into lunar orbit with this complete stack, if something happened to the propulsion system on the main engine, uh, we might have to use the descent propulsion system engine to get us back home again. This is called a dips burn. And to control this system, if the automatic control is not working, requires this translation controller. Uh, Fred and I had practiced that like previous crews. And that's the way we flew this particular device. Uh, but in part of our power down sequence, we had to, re we had to power down the attitude balls, the, the FDAIs as we call them. And because our platforms in Apollo are three gimbal type platforms that can go into what we call a gimbal lock and we can lose our alignment that way, uh, we had to make sure the spacecraft didn't in its gyrations get near that area. We had to look at the computer which read out this, these various angles. And it wasn't obvious how to fly it by looking at this computer as it was by looking at the uh, FDAI. Uh, in learning to fly just the command module and the LEM, you know, we found out that the attitude controller itself was adequate to control the vehicle in the response that you wanted it to do. Uh, this was a new mode of operation. I don't recall of uh, having practiced in the simulator before, and I, certainly no one has ever flown it in, in flight before, but it, the attitude controller itself worked uh, quite well. That in the light of the uh, experience you had on this flight, it would be advisable in the future to always remain on a free return re trajectory, or do you think that would limit future flights too much to a particular time or place? 
Well, I think it would probably limit our, our flight operations somewhat on free return trajectory, and I think the fact that we were not on one when the incident occurred and the fact that we could get back on one indicates that it's not required to stay on one during most of our lunar missions. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Jack Swigert, uh, as a last minute substitution, did you at any time have any doubt of your uh, ability to step in 24 hours before and fly the aircraft or spacecraft? Uh, no, not, not really. My, the only uh, apprehension that I have, of course, as Jim says, is that you, you work together as a crew. And I, had, had, uh, I haven't had much uh, experience. I just worked with Jim once or twice, uh, Jim and Fred once or twice previous. We did find that uh, the two days we had working together, that, uh, that we did almost everything the same. And once this was determined, I had uh, no apprehension at all. I felt that it was my job to get Jim and Fred there rested. I felt I could do that. I felt I could accomplish the majority of the uh, orbital science uh, objectives of the flight. And uh, I felt that we had a good mission and we could do it all. Captain Lovell, did you consider at the time, and do you consider now, that this could have been a meteorite strike or something internal? Uh, this thought uh, crossed our minds that it could have been a meteorite, uh, and I really don't have a, a complete answer whether it was or not, except for the fact that the panel was completely missing, which indicated that whatever went in must have caused a larger bang to blow the panel completely out, and that's, that's all I know about so far. Uh, Jim, after two days of uh, debriefing, could you give your, your estimate of the best probable cause of the, whatever blew your... Uh, oxygen tank and ended your mission to the moon? Uh, Jim, I don't think I can. I don't think I'm in position to because our debriefings so far have been uh, from the crew's point of view. Uh, it's unique, but we were only a few feet away from the accident, but the people on the ground uh, had a lot more information via telemetry than we had concerning pressures and temperatures and possible causes of, of the accident and have perhaps a, a better indication right now than we do of exactly what caused it. Referring to whether the Apollo 13 crew uh, might fly again to get to Far Morrow, we're informed today that, uh, uh, that such discussion did take place at debriefing, and I wonder if you could uh, confirm this and tell us under what circumstances it did. Uh, no discussion of that nature had taken place at any debriefing. As I said, if the agency wants this crew to go back to Frau Morrow, we'll be glad to go. Uh, if they decide to send another crew or not to go to Frau Morrow, that's their decision. This will go to all three astronauts. Physically speaking, what hardship did you suffer most from? Was it the cold or was it lack of sleep or was it cramped conditions in the lame? Why don't you take that? I didn't un I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, for what, co what were the, mo the worst physical hardships for you? Was it the cold or was it the lack of sleep or uncomfortable position in the lame? Well, it certainly was a combination of all, though the overpowering one was the uh, slow chill down until uh, about the last, uh, I don't know, 15, 16 hours. Uh, it was just, uh, well, you, we were just chilled down to the bone from there on in. And uh, we really didn't get warmed up uh, until we went through the power up and started getting a limb back up, and uh, and uh, we got started getting comfortable again. Along with this hardship of uh, lack of sleep, at uh, at least two occasions it was recommended that you might want to take a a stimulant, a dexedrine tablet. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do anything to uh, get yourself up for the reentry? <coughs> Uh, we uh, took dexedrine just prior to re-entry. Uh, we didn't want to take it too early because I was afraid that uh, with the lack, in my condition, with the lack of sleep, that uh, if the effects wore off, I'd be in worse condition than I was right there then. And I, uh, and I didn't feel too tired. You work a lot on nervous energy in this particular situation, and I didn't want to uh, suddenly get exhausted whereby I wasn't in good shape. I'd like to address this question to um, Jack Swigert. 
Um, this is a lighter question. Uh, has anyone nominated you as Bachelor of the Year, being the first bachelor to go in space? <laughs> no, ma'am, they haven't. <laughs> I think on that profound question, we'll knock it off now. Thank you very much. Do not blow in the microphone. Don't blow in the microphone. I was going to say, don't blow in the microphone.